Welcome back to Comic Book ASMR. Today we're going to be doing another comic book haul that's going to be dovetailed by uh, my Emerald City haul, which isn't large, but I'll throw it in at the end. So first off, I want to say, proudly say that this video has been sponsored by the good people at Manta Sleep. And so Manta Sleep is a company that um, their specialty is sleep masks. And uh, most sleep masks, you know, it's usually just kind of like the little thin piece of cloth goes across your face to block out light. But uh, these guys have one up to that. So as you'll see here, most of them you'll typically have like this sort of thing. What they have here are these eye cups. And the eye cups block out a hundred percent of light and these are also you can adjust them anywhere on the mask there's a little velcro thing and you can just move it wherever you want it on there because you know not everyone's face is symmetrical or anything like that but uh and then the cups the middle is caved in here that's to keep in mind like your eyelids and your eyelashes so you're blinking and stuff, you don't feel the mask still because you have that nice middle there. So they're super soft. And even too, if these ones don't work because it's kind of smaller, they have the bigger, the max eye cups you can use. Which, see, they're wider. So if you've got bigger eyelashes or whatever and seen them, there's, this is the part I was talking about. You can move that anywhere on the mask. And it's got a little guide where, hey, this way is where your nose is going to be. So the thicker part is where your nose ridge is going to rest. So super helpful. Uh, also, too, the mask is adjustable. This whole thing, you can move this part anywhere on the mask to tighten it. So really nice. And this is the base one. They do have other ones as well. They've got like a thinner one if you really don't like the feel of stuff on your head. They have a weighted one, as you know, like weighted blankets and stuff. They help with anxiety. Same case here. If you want a little extra weight, they have that. Uh, they have aromatherapy options. Um, they've also got different types of um, cups as well. They have ones that you can make cold. They have um, ones you can make warm. Uh, they also have a silk mask you can do, as well as silk eye cups that aren't listed here. But they have tons of options. The mask includes this, and then there's a, a few little ear plugs in there as well. So you can block out all that sound as well. And they sell the ear plugs separately if you like, but there are two included with the mask as well. And then there's even another mask too that's not shown on these. It's the pro mask it's thicker and it's got more reinforcement on the side for side sleepers now emma i am a side sleeper and this worked pretty well for me anyway but just in case you're still like oh this didn't quite do it for me uh they do have that but um yeah so uh, basically what you want to do to help the channel out is just click the link in the description it'll take you to the site and i'll get a little commission off of that so once you once again, thank you very much, uh, Manta Sleep, and uh, let's get on to the haul here. First, we have Amazing Fantasy, number 1000. As you all know, Amazing Fantasy was where Spider-Man got his start. Uh, so this is a nice little compilation anniversary type of book. A lot of big names in here, as you can see. We got art by Michael Cho in here. Um, Jim Chung, Ryan Stegman, Olivia Ocopio, um I don't know this guy, Giuseppe there. Uh, Terry Dodson, uh, I don't know, Marco there. Steve McNiven, writing credits. We've got um, uh, Michael Cho's doing writing there, which is interesting. Uh, Dan Slott. I don't know these ones here. See Kurt Busiek there, as well as Neil Gaiman. And what's fun with the Neil da Gaiman one is they actually show Neil in that particular story. So, yeah, lots of great uh, solid art 
all throughout this book here. And then in the back there was a, a writer who passed away and so they did like a special spotlight credit on their story. And it has uh, art by Todd Nock for that particular one. There's some of the Dodson art and then there's the copial art there. So yeah, this is a nice little book here. And then that cover, of course, that's the variant by J. Scott Campbell. And this is the McNiven. And yeah, see, we've got Neil Gaiman. He actually, it's about him when he met Steve Ditko, which is pretty awesome because Ditko is a very private person. And so it's just kind of recounting his time meeting him there. So yeah, unfortunately the writer, uh, Mike Pasculio, passed away. And then Todd Nock did uh, the art in this one. And so this is its own little kind of spotlight amongst this. So, yeah, really nice. And I was surprised that this wasn't 10 It was actually $8 for this particular one, even though it's, you know, square bound, probably 100 pages. Next, we got kind of a unique project here. This is a book inspired by Evanescence uh, called Echoes from the Void. I believe the concept is um, they're doing a series of um, different songs with, you know, visual interpretation to those songs. I don't know a ton of Evanescence. I mean, I was introduced to them through the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie back in the day. And I mean, that was really effective for that movie. I know people pan it all the time, but I actually enjoyed it and I definitely was, you know, um, given goosebumps from, from the Evanescence's music throughout it. So, I had a few songs in there. So that was the first time I had ever heard them. And yeah, I've heard a few other of their songs, but I'm certainly not a super fan. But as you guys know, I love music and I love art. So anytime that can be combined, you know, I am super excited about it. And it's going to continue on here. So this looks like the art style for the next issue. And then they've got other kind of um, projects as well. I saw the Disturbed one before. I believe that the Disturbed cover was initially back in the day uh, done by Greg Capolo. I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, so they've got all sorts of different uh, musicians here and with comics coming out. And then they have a Evanescence Breath of the Wild a variant cover there, which is fun. So, and then there's the tour dates. So, pretty cool, kind of unique, you know. And we have Action Comics, number 1046. So, as you guys know, we've been doing the uh, Detective Comics Bermejo covers. And it looks like, hopefully, fingers crossed, he's moved on to do a series of Superman covers. Hopefully this is not a one-off for him. But if it is, okay. But as you all know, I love Bermejo. So yeah, the War World story still going strong. It's actually going to wrap here. I have uh, a special to show off. And it finally wraps up in that special. So, unfortunately, I'm still not seeing any Federici art. Uh, maybe it was just kind of a deadline thing, which is a bummer because I really felt that his style elevated the story, you know, with that gladiatorial Superman and everything and just kind of how he draws. It just really fit very well. Um, so, I'm kind of bummed, but that's unfortunately how it is in comics a lot of if you can't work fast enough um, to hit those deadlines they've got to find someone who can so I don't know if that's what happened but it certainly seems that way so finally is the Superman War World Apocalypse number one and this is the conclusion to the whole event 
And yeah, once again, we see um, quite a few different uh, artists there, but I do not see Federici among them. So I can only speculate that that's what happened. I see on occasion he'll do like covers and stuff he's been posting on his um on his Instagram and things like that. But you know you can only glean so much from that. But I've been enjoying this. This has been a really great uh memorable storyline. I'm surprised it's gone on I mean it's literally been like a year. So kind of surprising, but it's been worth it. So I look forward to reading this and getting that conclusion to this sweeping epic. Okay, next we have the Batman White Knight Presents Red Hood. This is book two. We see, I'm trying to remember the name of this character, but his episodes in Batman Beyond are some of my favorite. And they even kind of talk about ASMR inadvertently. And this was years before ASMR was considered a thing. I think this was back in maybe the year 2000. Um, the, the boss there, he rewards his goon by giving him time with a tuning fork to elicit pleasure from him. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm wondering if the guy who wrote this episode had any clue about ASMR at the time. But yeah, uh, what's his name? I think it's Shriek, if I remember correctly, is this guy. And even in the in the uh, cartoons, I think he looked a bit like ephemeral riff, just kind of how he looked. Here he looks a tad bit different. But yeah, when I first got introduced to Ephemeral Rift and all that type of stuff, and ASMR in general was through his channel and his comic book video he had done. And so I'm just like, this guy kind of reminds me of that guy where I remembered about that episode with the tuning fork and all that. And then this first meeting he did, uh, where he was trying to convince Bruce Wayne that he was insane but he kept calling Bruce Bruce and he's like I knew it wasn't my voice because I call myself Batman so just kind of a genius plot point there but yeah so this continues to be good this is by a different artist than Sean Gordon Murphy but the book is still set in you know the same story that Sean Gordon Murphy has been building so yeah it's good stuff. Next we have a cool one here. This is the Detective Comics 27 facsimile. So this is an accurate recreation of the first Batman comic. So it's complete, I believe. It's as accurate as you can get it without having counterfeit issues. I suppose it's got the Slam Bradley story in there in all sorts of just random stories. The Batman story is actually not that much of the comic, but that's why it's fun, because often that'll get reprinted, you know, in other trades and things like that. But this gives you the full comic in one sitting here, giving you the true glimpse of kind of experiencing the book when it came out, so. So pretty nice, and then there is, of course, the chemical caper, or whatever it was called here. The case of the chemical syndicate, yeah. So yeah, there he is. Next we have Batman Fortress, number four. Some Green Lantern action there. And this cover is interesting because I remember he went to the Lanterns for help in the previous issue and they turned him down. So this is following up. It looks like they changed their mind. 
I did find out too this story is going to be eight parts so not even six like I was thinking initially but it's going to be eight parts so but yeah I've been enjoying it it's uh, really fun to look at and it's just kind of one of those you know what if type stories and it's kind of anything goes I know what the aliens had killed Perry White I believe they lit Superman's farmhouse on fire with Ma and Pa Kent. Or no, they had sold it. It was still their old house, though. They were looking for him. And they're like, we just bought this place. So they lit his old house on fire. Um, lots of crazy stuff. So, oh, this guy got wrecked there. So yeah, definitely a fun book to pick up. Uh, next we have Detective Comics number 1063. This is a Jim Lee variant. So this continues the opera storyline written by Ram V. So just kind of, this is a different sort of Batman story. I'm assuming this is the main villain. This is literally only the second part of it. So this is called Overture. And then we've got Raphael Albuquerque doing the art. He does good work. So it's nice to look at. It's just kind of got some unique elements to it, you know, being rooted in the opera and all this sort of stuff. Okay. Next we got the Fortnite Marvel Zero War number four. Like a cuddle team leader mixed with a sentinel, almost, being controlled by Dr. Doom. So that's a pretty awesome cover there. I haven't opened this or anything yet, so um, normally I have it open. I just didn't do it this time. So you guys have seen the art. It's the same creative team as the previous ones. Donald Mustard is still heavily involved in all of these crossover comics. He did the DC ones as well. He's like the creative director for Fortnite. So it's really cool to see that he is still being involved in the process. And I actually don't know what the code from number four will get you. I think this one had just come out. So it's a surprise to me, but the codes have been really good. You've got like a Spider-Man suit, a Wolverine, uh, and then you get like uh, you can have his claws for other people to use, I believe. So next we're going to transition to a few bigger items we got. So I got the Spawn Compendium number three, which what's exciting about this is Todd um, has never gone through and reprinted all of the Spawn stories. I believe there are issues in here that a lot of people... Um, have never been able to find because as you know spawn went on less people were buying it unfortunately and so the print count got lower and so a lot of people who bought their issues in this run are keeping them you know and even some of the later ones that i have like in the 200s are like that too so so he's really pushing um you know, the celebration of Spawn here and trying to get people to get caught up now, which is awesome. He's seeing the market wanting his product, being hungry for it, uh, and rightfully so. You know, Spawn has been around for a bit now, so it's cool that he is going back and kind of doing that victory lap and making these stories uh, accessible for those who either missed out, like I did, or, you know, don't want to ruin their nice copies of their books they have or whatever it is. My only gripe still, they do not put the actual covers for these 
he's doing separate cover run books. He's only done one volume so far. I think it's issues number one through 200, so it's only covered literally up to here is through 150 so far. So, But it's nice that he's still doing this because, I mean, if he put the covers in here, then, you know, you're looking at an additional 50 pages in each book, and these are already ridiculously huge, especially for you know, a trade paperback. This thing is massive. It probably weighs seven pounds, something like that. The $60 book, if this was a hardback, it would easily be a hundred. So he's making it more attainable by going with the trade paperback route. Um, so yeah, it's just very cool. And he is guaranteed he's doing um, a volume four as well. It's already been advertised and solicited saying hey this is coming at some point so that'll c catch it up to issue 200 and he has never reprinted everything up that far he's done a few arcs here and there um, but it's nice that he's finally putting them like this and I've got I started buying an issue I think 220 or something like that so so I'll still need that fifth volume if he does it Next we have Alex Ross's Fantastic Four, Full Circle, and this is a beautiful, beautiful book. So this is all Alex Ross artwork. This is a full story he's done, but it's different. It's not all painted like he typically does. So the uh, the opening flap here, you do get what he's done in a lot of like the DC Origins and stuff like that. You get like the full you know, initial how everyone was made, which he's been known to do, but this just goes um, in a different direction. So the story is done in kind of this interesting, uh, he's penciled and inked everything, and he may have even done the coloring on this, but this is not uh, his typical painted work. Yeah, it says art and script, so this is all done by him, but it's done in a different way. And uh, I remember he did kind of like a side Kingdom Come story, I think just called The Kingdom, maybe, if I remember correctly, in like 2008 or so. It's like a one-shot, and he did a little bit of that. So this kind of reminds me of that a little bit, where it was um, like his pencils and inks and it was colored over. So it's interesting if he literally even did the coloring process here, but he didn't go on to paint it but yeah it's just this art is still great to look at even if it's not painted the man is a master like this is still really really nice to look at so i look forward to checking this out and reading it and uh yeah just kind of enjoying it's very much rooted in the kirby visuals but you know still true to how alex ross does his stuff too so it just really, it's really excites me just looking through this and seeing this. I can't wait to read the whole story. And then underneath the cover here is like a little hollow, hollow foil four on there. It's gonna clip the, there we go. So yeah, really nice. So, and this was a $25 book. I don't think the story is I don't think the story is uh, typically huge. I think it's maybe uh, maybe around 100 pages. You can kind of see it there. But for $25 and to get a full Alex Ross story, which you don't often find, is pretty awesome. All right. Moving on to box number two, we have the Armageddon game number two for the Ninja Turtles. Yeah, so this is just um, setting up, and this is like the biggest event the Turtles have had in a long time for the IDW series. So this is kind of all their threats pooling together um, to just really mess stuff up. And Shredder is back, but he is actually helping the turtles in this instance. 
uh, against the threats of Baxter and the Rat King. And uh, the Rat King, as I've said before here, is not, you know, crazy guy living in the sewers. He's like a godly sort of entity who's friends with other kind of animal type gods. So the threat here is just a touch bit different <laughs> than, you know, the, the Rat King from the old days. And then we have, like, I think that's Null is her name. I can't remember. She was big with the Adventures series from Archie, and I never really read much of that, so. But, yeah, I look forward to seeing what happens with this, too. This little chess piece cover there. Oh, it's by San Luco, too. San Luco is one of my favorite uh, Turtles artists. He doesn't do interiors much the last... Uh, series he did for them was the Shredder and Hell story. I highly recommend it was like a five-part mini-series so good Next we have Robin number 17 And he's dealing with some issues here that have been a little bit. I think this is set up. Yeah through the um, Demon God who is recently been spotlighted in the world's finest book by Mark Wade. Damien has stumbled upon the opening or will stumble upon the opening of this demon king who's like hundreds of years old and I'm sure it's gonna possess him and make him do some not kind things to his father so and at, at least he is kind of possessed with this though because like Damien has grown a lot as a character he's certainly not who he was and as I've said before I used to 100% hate Damien um, I just thought he was annoying but I enjoyed his growth as a character and um, he's come a long way so I was like oh man they're gonna backtrack and just make him hate his dad again but it looks like he's just going to be possessed and that'll be the reason for what happens. Next we have Swamp Thing 16. This is the final issue in the series with this beautiful Brian Bolin cover. Look at that. Love Brian's style. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this Swamp Thing uh, conclusion here. If you haven't bought it at this part, this is literally the last one, so I would recommend uh, looking out for the trades when they come out. Uh, I think this is some of these guys' finest work. It's just really detailed. Uh, it's really interesting to look at. Story's a bit over my head, unfortunately, but when you read so many books, um, complexities get lost, unfortunately, so... But that doesn't mean it's not a good story. But yeah, I certainly feel like this is uh, gonna be a, a highlight for sure in Swamp Thing's ongoing stories. So interesting to see what happens with the character next. Next we have Scorch to number nine. Said before, this is my least favorite of all the spawn titles, um, but it's still a spawn title, so I buy it anyway. The art's good and stuff, uh, but it focuses a lot more on the second string characters, which is fine, but you know, mainly follow spawn for spawn. I just want to make sure I'm not missing any side liners notes that come from these particular stories else they got haunt in here now so that's pretty cool haunt's a really neat character and we have gunslinger number 11 and I feel with both of these series, I'm trying to figure out where they actually fit in on the normal spawn timeline. Because it almost feels like these are kind of tugging at a different thread that are that's like leading up to other elements in the spawn ongoing story. 
so it's a bit odd. I do like the art in this. I like the story. Just trying to figure out where everything fits in. But yeah, Brent Booth is a solid talent, so I like his stuff. And it's nice to see him working on Spawn. Next we have Baxter Stockman's Best Of, which I'm surprised they continued on to do more of these. So uh, I'm trying to remember if they've who who all they've done yet. But this literally might be the last one. I think it may be because who else is there? In these later ones, they were really kind of showing um, the threats that are the current issue in. Um, the Armageddon game. So yeah, we get his first appearance here. Old school Eastman turtles here with the mousers and everything. And yeah, at this point, you know, I grew up with the cartoons for the longest time. I always thought Baxter mainly as like a white guy, but historically it looks like Baxter has been uh, African American through most of the iterations. And even like this is the Fox uh, Turtles run from the Saturday morning show, which I never watched any of that, so I would like to actually go back and watch that. But this is a story from that line, and the same thing, yeah. So it's interesting that, you know, I was raised on the 80s show and thought of him that way, but he's really an African American guy. And then, of course, the final one is the IDW uh, micro series here. Just kind of showcasing the genius of him and everything like that and at this point he definitely wasn't on par where he is now now he's currently the mayor of new york in this series and in a very large position of power so pretty neat next we have a key that i found here i never owned this as a kid i have the trade on the shelf with this but yeah so this is the issue when Batman's back gets broken here. This is the second printing, unfortunately. But I figured, yeah, why not? And yeah, so this is like the little paper cardboard thing and it wraps around the whole cover there. And this is the direct edition one. It's not the newsstand one, which is rarer. But yeah, just an iconic book and I'm glad that I have it in my collection now. And then they had some random like bargain bin stuff here. So this is an arachnophobia book. It's half price. Got it for two fifty. So just kind of for the sheer novelty of it, I figured that's ah, two bucks or whatever. Why not? So yeah, this is the full story of arachnophobia done in comic book style. Did not know that this existed. But yeah, it's cool to see. And I like that the art, it's almost like it's, I think the coloring is just straight up like painted in here. You can kind of see a bit of brush strokes in it. I could be totally wrong, but that's what I see when I look at it. I see kind of like, it's not a like a flat fill on these. So pretty neat. Approved by the Comics Code Authority, yeah. Who put this out? Um, it just looks like it says Hollywood. Yeah, Hollywood Comics. And then we got another obscure book here too. So this is a comic about JFK. Once again, got it in the bargain bin. They had this right by the register there, this half price books. Not, not the shop half price books, but the, the box at the shop was marked half price. I was like, oh, let's see what they have. And so, yeah, this is um, um, a very concise history of JFK here. And yeah, it just kind of goes through everything as succinctly as it can 
early days, all this sort of stuff. The book is not in great shape, but that's fine. It doesn't need to be. I was just more interested in the fact that this was a thing. So, you know, and JFK is definitely a very important historical figure. And, of course, to experience a little bit of that through a comic book is always fun. But, yeah, it even covers the assassination and assassination in here. It's not graphic by any stretch, but... So it does show the moment, just not the horrible, horrible visuals. I made the mistake of looking that up quite a few years back, and I can't believe how brutal that was. I'm still just, I can't imagine that. Wasn't aware it was so severe. So finally I'm gonna show off what I got here at Emerald City. So it's not much, which is why it's bookend here. That's why there wasn't a full video or anything. So my book I had um, already had acquired previously, had signed here. So this is Carnage's first appearance, signed by old uh, Emberlin here, the inker, co-creator of Carnage. The whole team helped co-create him. So yeah, I wasn't aware he was a part of that. He's been to quite a few conventions in the past. But I was like, oh, I wasn't aware. So then I got him to sign this, so that was cool. Um, he's an art instructor in Portland now, I believe. So he does quite a few art shows in the area here and there. And we got my um, Harley Quinn signed by Mateo Sclarera right there. So this wasn't a must-have on the list for me, but I'm like, oh, I like this art, I like this guy, so let's have him sign that. So, And I got my twig number one signed by the artist here, Kyle Stram. It's the signature there. And as you guys know, I absolutely love Twig. So if you haven't picked it up, please do. I think the last issue just came out. It's a lot of fun. And there'll more, there will more than likely be a second volume real soon. So, And then I got um, to meet the guy who voiced the Tick. So that was cool, which was a surprise to me. We got a nice spoon inscription there. He wrote my name. Tick doing the dishes. And I should have actually got another signature on here too, but um, I was broke. So even getting this signature was not one I planned on because the Tick was voiced by the same guy who voiced Mikey, which I didn't know. I'd always, you know, Mikey is the surfer guy voice. I had always keyed into um, Townsend's work um, with the tick voice on like television bumpers and stuff for NBC and all this sort of thing. So, but yeah, he totally does a put on surfer voice. You know, he's channeling the guy from Fast Times, an old school 80s movie. But um, yeah, so he is the voice of Mikey and the tick. And then Rob Paulson was the voice of Arthur in later seasons. So I wish I had got him to write Not in the Face, which was Arthur's battle cry on uh, the tick but yeah so this was the main reason I went here I got all of my stickers signed by the original voice cast to display with my Eastman photo that I took in June with my son and my best friend here so really nice and I'm glad that I finally have this this is gonna go right up in my display with my figures and my pops and my signed comics so really happy this is just kind of the cherry on the top for my turtles collection but this was the reason i went to emerald city uh mainly everything we did we just kind of waited for these signatures and then it was kind of like free time for the kids just kind of walked around uh the show was busier than i thought it would be uh but still not crazy impressive they are gonna come back in march 
which is good. That's closer to the normal time they used to do March and or April. So I'll look forward to having the schedule be back to normal. The normal show, you know, in spring instead of they did one at Christmas time and then they just did this one. So, but yeah, so happy I have this. And then I got a brightened up print done as well to put in here because the previous one was really dingy. And then one more thing I got. So this was the last like main turtle figure I needed here. It got Krang. I always wanted him as a kid. Never had him. And even as the vendor was selling him to me, it was the Bobacon booth, which is actually here in Everett, but they also, they do shows and stuff too. The guy's like, oh man, this one's actually nicer than my own figure. I should have kept this. <laughs> So as he was selling it to me, he's like, oh, man, he got the better one. So, yeah, but this is great. This was only 35 and this is like the first run version. Um, you know, they've got reprints and stuff like that, but you can see the... Um, you can see the date there. 1989. So yeah, that's the first run. They have, I think they have one that just came out that's a reprint that they did. It was like the Technodrome box with a four pack or whatever, but yeah, I'm so glad I have Krang and I'll gladly put him up, finish my display out. All right, well that's gonna do it for me. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and as always, you all have a super slumber. Thanks, bye.